Hello. I'm Tim Rogers. You are watching Kotaku.com. On October 11th, 2019, 25 years to the day from October 11th, 1994. October 11th, 2019 is a Friday. However, October 11th, 1994 was a Tuesday. I remember it was a Tuesday because I had eaten lunch with my brother and his friends that day, which I was only able to do on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I also remember it was a Tuesday because I remember absolutely everything about my life. Quote, thanks, unquote, to a neurological condition I have suffered since I was about four years old. Now, Final Fantasy VI, as you newfangled highfalutin millennial children's call it, I call it Final Fantasy III. It maintains a dark iron grip upon my soul. For when I first played this game, I was maybe the worst person I have been in my entire life. This game arrived into the hands of a craven, selfish, mute, self-taught vegetarian who had never talked to a girl yet would someday touch a guitar. Final Fantasy III changed my life, whether I wanted it to or not. Whether a life wants to change or needs to change or not. When someone says to you, people can change, your immediate response should take the shape of when ain't they doing so anyway welcome back to the goblin bunker we've got something very special planned for you today it involves playing a little bit of final fantasy 3 because one can only play so much of it in a short amount of time What we're going to be doing in lieu of playing too much of it is reminiscing a little bit. So to reminisce a little bit, I want to take you all back to the barbecue smoke-like black cloudy dead television colored sky of October 11th, 1994 in Indianapolis, Indiana. When I first encountered this game, walking over from Wendy's while my mom bought my little brother nuggets. I entered the video vault store and what did I see? Well, I had seen something. I saw this. I saw this Final Fantasy 3 box art that I had never seen because video games did not have press release box art reveals in 1994. They didn't even have release dates. Most of them didn't have release dates. We had Sonic 2 came out on Sonic Tuesday for some ungodly godforsaken reason. We knew the release date of God Darn Donkey Kong Country but we didn't know the release date of Final Fantasy 3. We had an ad in EGM. It was two pages. It wasn't a very good ad. It was probably done by some New York agency. It required you to tilt the magazine 90 degrees in order to read it. Didn't show the game's box art. Didn't know what the box art looked like until I had it in my hand at the video vault. All the advertisement had said was that it was arriving October 1994. We did not know the day. Turned out it was 10 11 94. That's the first day I saw this box art. And it stands to reason that the first day I saw the box art was also the first day I flipped it over. Now, I'd seen screenshots already. Now, on the back of the box, there was one screenshot. Now I found this bold. 
We got someone in the chat saying they saw it in a Babbage's weekend sale pamphlet in the newspaper. You get Babbage's pamphlets in your newspaper? That's wild. We didn't have those in the newspaper. I went into quite some detail about a uh, about newspaper uh, circular advertisements in a large essay that I wrote about Final Fantasy III, which might be going live on Kotaku.com if uh, if I, I summon the courage to click publish is how it's going. So this is Final Fantasy III. And this is... Uh, I read the back of this box. Now, I didn't get to go out much, so I didn't get to see it in No Toys R Us or any place that might have had like a display. Now, look at... The, the back of the box impresses me even now. It impresses me even now. Because... There's no bullet points. There's no list of specs. Back then, games were proud of how many goddamn megabytes were contained within their cartridges. This game doesn't have any of that. No bullet points. Doesn't say how many levels there are. Doesn't announce the amount of hours of gameplay. All you had to do was read this. And go by your gut. And know. Just know. So, I'm gonna read the back of this box. If you'd all like. Final Fantasy 3. Magitech has been reborn, and the end of the world is near. Ages ago, evil beings created powerful creatures called espers and unleashed them against each other. The resulting battle left their world a smoldering rubble. Legend has it, the espers destroyed themselves and most of humanity. Magic disappeared forever. Centuries have passed and a rational world now exists with espers living only in myths until one frozen solid since the ancient wars is unearthed. Suddenly, there are reports of magical attacks on civilians. Imperial commandos launch raids using magic-powered Magitech weapons. Magic is obviously alive again. And the world is in danger again. Who or what is behind the rediscovery and redeployment of this legendary power? What chaotic plans exist that will wreak havoc on this orderly world? I accidentally added an extra word again up there in the spirit of the word again. It's good to just have it in there twice. Basically what we have is three paragraphs of terse prose setting the stage for the immediate outset of the game. I dare you to god darn find another video game that does that. It's got the god darn word redeployment in there. Commandos launch raids using magic powered Magitech weapons. I absolutely love it. I mean, that's Final Fantasy III, so I actually didn't really know what the story was about. I'd seen screenshots both in Electronic Gaming Monthly and in my favorite magazine, Game Players. I'm going to tell you something. Age 14, I wore sweatpants everywhere every day. I don't know anybody else who... Uh, let me know if you haven't ever had the experience of wearing sweatpants every day for a little while. And uh, I didn't have any friends. I lived at night. I, I got home from school and I went to bed and I woke up at about midnight, made macaroni and cheese, did my studies. Reread. God darn. Game Players Magazine, October 1994. Sonic and Knuckles on the cover. S and K. The real king of fighters right here. Knuckles, uh, this, this punk is, uh, spraying out the word Nintendo. How long? And how, how obsessive my assessments and reassessments of the covers of these magazines. Now, I had read literature at this point. I was teaching myself multiple foreign languages. Though I was not above laughing at the detail that Knuckles' uh, paint can has only the words non-toxic on it. Really impressed me. Now, this cover... The Game Players Revolution Month 2. This is before they leading up to the reveal of the new title, Ultra Game Players. Game Players was my favorite magazine. Home of Jeff Lucky Lundrigan. Now you're going to notice something. 
Jeff Lucky Lundgren, the best. Best in the god darn business. Um, and we're gonna get to him in a second. You wanna look at this? Do you see this? Does everybody see what I'm, uh, what I'm cooking here? Final Fantasy III. Best RPG ever. Notice the courage. Do you see the courage? Do you see the god darn bravery of this? I want you all, I want someone to point out what is it that impressed me the most about this cover in October of 1994. It's the god darn exclamation point. It is not a question mark. No meal cursed the mouth of these critical individuals. They, they had no mealy mouthishness whatsoever. They declared... They did not leave it up to interpretation. They were not here to please your ego's idea of what the best RPG ever was. And I will admit here, 25 years removed, this font underneath full reviews, I can't read that. I gotta lean my head in real far to the screen to read whatever that's saying. Sparkster? That says Sparkster. And then I, I, I can't read that, that is, that is bad contrast. Bad contrast. So, uh... Exclamation point. Ma maximum carnage, don't miss our boss-busting tactics. So notice... And I mean, here is here is the thing about being a sweatpantsy and individual at this point in time. I was a member of the club, and it was my club. The goddamn Final Fantasy Club. I loved Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy never got a cover story on one of these magazines. It just never got one. And that's, uh... That's a tragic shame. We got Sonic and Knuckles, and it's clearly some sort of marketing decision, because if you were to read the review inside this magazine that Jeff Lucky Lundrigan had written, you would, you would know that Jeff Lucky Lundrigan and everyone else on the staff at Game Players Magazine was 100% down with putting Final Fantasy III on the cover. And I just... I shudder and I shiver to imagine the silver spoony individual who walked in and said, you know, put that Sonic the Hedgehog on the cover. Isn't there a new one of those? They would have put Final Fantasy on the cover. I really wish I had a screenshot of the review for you to read. I do. It's right here. Um, this review changed my life. And I think I owe the fact that I've written an essay about video games to this video game review. When I started writing about video games, people were like, there's this guy out there who writes about his dinner when he reviews a game. Let's kill him. Right? So, here's the thing. Here's the god darn thing. I'm gonna scroll this up Star Wars style. First of all, look at the god darn flavor here. The god darn flavor. They had such taste and class 25 years ago. Again, I had read literature. I had taught myself a few foreign languages. I didn't speak to anybody. I didn't have any friends. Nobody to speak them languages to. Though, I read these video game magazines and every once in a while as a sort of hobby and indulgence, what back then I would call a guilty pleasure and right now I would just call a pleasure. It is a pleasure to look at this. If you love the graphic design of this, by the way, uh, look forward to the video game truck heck. So, this, uh, this little byline here, they, they had such fun with bylines. And if I had my way, we would redesign Kotaku.com to look exactly like this. Which is, maybe not exactly, but more like this. And you'd have just a big giant byline and a big dumb picture of everybody by every article. Call me up, web designers. Uh, and let me sit there and just tell you what's good. After finally having the cops break into his apartment to make sure he was okay, we had Jeff Lundrigan dictate this review, since we couldn't pry the controller out of his hands. So, the first paragraph of this review blew my mind. And I want to show you this first paragraph, and actually, I want to perform a reading of this entire review, if that's okay. We can notice, I've noticed a few people in the chat noticing. Yes, the game was $79.99. It was $80. Y'all complain about $59.99 right now, except it, inflation, $59.99 is like pretty much like $42 in, in this year's 
currency for a goddarn 15 year old don't call me what I was a fat boy with sweatpants and a big old just giant dead dog of a hairdo sitting on top of my head no prospects no friends no life no job you mow the lawn because uh, you're supposed to not because mommy gives you a dollar 79 goddarn dollars a Mount Everestian struggle I, I, I endured to obtain this game and I did obtain this game I obtained it in December of 1994 so uh, let us read this review the first paragraph the mind blower here we go deep inside me there was a huge empty hole for years I tried to fill it with alcohol dangerous sports faster and faster cars loud music and countless women Nothing could help me until Final Fantasy 3. Sell the house, sell the kids, play the game. Seriously, I'm a big fan of RPGs. I've played them all. So when I say that Final Fantasy 3 is the best RPG I've ever seen, you gotta realize what that means. The screenshots on this page can't begin to give you an idea of how drop-dead gorgeous the graphics are, and they sure can't help you hear the exceptionally fine soundtrack. At 24 megs, this game sets new standards for big, sprawling adventures. There's so much stuff to find, experiment with, and learn to use that we could dedicate an entire issue to it. But Final Fantasy II fans know that what really set the game apart was the incredible storyline. Characters argued fell in love, even sacrificed their lives for each other. And that story doesn't even begin to touch what's in store for you when you pick up Final Fantasy III. I don't want to give anything away, but let's just say that Final Fantasy III has more than twice as many main characters as Final Fantasy II. The bottom line is simple. If you're only going to buy one SNES game this year, Make it Final Fantasy 3. You're gonna need it to live. And then, of course, these reviews were always about the box outs and the captions and the images and showing the reader stuff, what's going on, tell you a little bit about the story. They don't tell you too much about the story because uh, back then they didn't spoil stuff generally. You didn't know what you were getting into until you had the goddamn game on your lap. A bowl of cereal, reading the instruction manual, Friday night. Everybody else is at the football game, you know? You're not at the football game because you don't like anybody there. You get the second page of the review, and you're going to see this. And this, I put to you. I put to you this. The ratings. Graphics 10. Full 256 color display makes this the best looking RPG ever. Heck, this is one of the best-looking SNES games ever. Music and sound effects. The music always fits the mood and fills the room gloriously. The sound effects are always there and always perfect. Always. Bells and whistles. Masses of weapons and items to fool with. I could go on and on. Without a doubt, this is the most intricate and engaging storyline ever control. Every menu is laid out in the most optimum manner possible. You can even buy items and vehicles to move around the map faster. Replay value. You're gonna miss a lot the first time, so you're gonna wanna play again. How many times can you play a game that takes you 60 to 80 hours to play? Overall, 98%. I love it. Now we've got Chris Slate here. Good old Chris Slate says Jeff is right. This game is easily the best RPG ever and one of the best carts of all time. Cart stands for cartridges. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a game that looks or sounds better. On top of that, all the new features and gameplay adjustments make FFIII a natural evolution of the series. Not just the same game with different characters. If you're an RPG fan, kneel before your SNES and thank your chosen god. If not, 
You should go out and buy this game anyway. It's the perfect example of what good RPG is all about. Maybe that's supposed to be pronounced role-playing gaming. We can go through the image caption, so I think you get the idea. I think you get it. If you don't get the idea, how am I supposed to help you, right? Ultra game players. Before it was ultra game players. It's just game players at this point. 98%. Does one need a higher review score? So Jeff Lucky Lundrigan says at the end of his review in October 1994 issue of uh, Game Players Magazine that if you buy one SNES game this year, you should buy Final Fantasy III. And I'm not going to lie to you all. I had already told my mom I wanted Donkey Kong Country for Christmas, and I even had the pre-order t-shirt. And I wore it every day under my god darn flannels. So I wore flannels with my sweatpants. And uh, I'm telling you, it was it was god darn flop sweats, hours upon hours. It was it was it was torture, knowing what kind of a crime I committed by putting my hat in the god darn ring for god darn Donkey Kong, god darn country, for king, for country, for Donkey Kong country. I mean, am I right? Right? And uh, I didn't. I ended up getting Donkey Kong because, of course, I'm going to, right? I mean, I ended up playing it. I ended up having to rent Final Fantasy III several times. And every time I rented it, someone had deleted my save. And they had played the game for less than an hour. And they had named Terra some profane word. Inside me, there was a hole, and I needed to fill it with god darn Final Fantasy. At any rate, that's enough about Jeff Lucky Lundrigan. If you'd like to know more about Jeff Lucky Lundrigan, I have written an essay about Final Fantasy III. Now, this essay may or may not be published soon. Should I find myself capable of mustering the courage to click that publish button, I will not be performing a live reading of this essay as it is slightly too long and contains an extreme amount of profanity. An extreme amount of profanity. I can tell you, it is called How and Why I Never Finished Becoming a Detective or Yelling After My Bones Are Gone An Inverted Review of Final Fantasy VI 1994 Final Fantasy VI arrived in North American retail stores 25 years ago today on October 11th, 1994. Back then, it called itself Final Fantasy III. I remember this exact date because I remember everything because of a rare neurological condition I have suffered my whole life. I also remember this date because exactly 59 days later, an arsonist who would never be caught burned down my high school gymnasium's brand new $6 million gymnasium. I messed up that last line. Burned down my high school's brand new $6 million gymnasium. Could call this one growing up 94. Anyway, what if, you know, just entertain this notion as I sip my final gulp of coffee. Entertain a notion, if you will, that there is a, a man or at the very least a human individual in this room who's about to god darn play Final Fantasy 3 on the SNES Classic. Did you know it's actually not called the SNES Mini? People call it the Mini all the time. The SNES Mini. The word Mini is actually not in the name. Surely enough, it is a tiny little baby buddy of a video game console. It's not nearly the full size of the god darn real thing. The real thing was a god darn beef magnet. So, we're going to go ahead and launch into this and we're going to see what we got. Lightly gingerly, I tread across the room as I did not want to rub my Vapor Maxes too hard against the carpet, which would cause me to suffer massively uncomfortable shockings. Uh, what do we got? Um, we got uh, okay. Final Fantasy 3. Look at that little Moogle on there. You know, I got the SNES Classic. I bought it immediately because I'm a goddamn sucker. And uh, I don't have a lot of money. 
in my life. Though, uh, I grew up respecting a goddamn deal, you know? So I respect the deal. Super Metroid, lovely game. Legend of Zelda, lovely game. Super Punch Out, you know, whatever. Contra Through the Alien Wars, you know, whatever, sign me up, I don't care. Donkey Kong Country, Get Bent, T-shirt, man. Uh, no, I like DK Country, so it's alright. They should have DKC2. We're gonna play Final Fantasy 3. Notice it has a little two-player icon on there. It has a very loose, it's kind of a an anti-socials optimistic two-player, because you can play two-player battles where it really has no function, where it's you can divide up which character is controlled by which controller. It's it's pretty hammy, and uh, I've never played it that way. I've never played it. Uh, if anybody wants to ever come over to the Goblin Bunker. Ted Woolsey? Ted Woolsey, if you're watching, come over and play Final Fantasy III with me. Uh, two players. Everybody, Ted Woolsey's on Twitter. He follows me on Twitter. Um, met Ted Woolsey before. Ted Woolsey's the translator of this game. Met Ted Woolsey, but I never met Jeff Lucky Lundrigan. I tried to find him a couple months ago while I was writing that essay that I alluded to earlier. Anyway. And I mean, of course, Earthbound is here. Somebody asks, you don't have anything to say about Earthbound? Come on. Of course, I have a lot to say about Earthbound. You're going to have to pay me thousands of dollars up front to hear what I have to say about Earthbound because I got, I got pearls. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. I don't, I don't think so highly of myself. In fact, I think quite lowly of myself. Let's ignore that for the moment. I've launched the game. I've launched the game. Heck yes, I met Woolsey. Of course I met Woolsey. Love the title screen, first of all. And then we get the organ. The beautiful organ mode. Chrono Kid says, I played the two-player mode. My friend and I had a good old time. Oh, that's good. Give me that organ. Do you know how sophisticated this was? To a large 15-year-old in the year. In the 1994 times. One of the first things I did when uh, I uprooted my stupid self and transported my living carcass over to a country on the other side of an ocean, living on a goddamn island. Talk about Japan. I bought a Super Famicom and I bought a copy of Final Fantasy VI for about two dollars. Oh, notice I've I. This was, this was actually the first game I played on my SNES Classic. I, I launched it and I played a little bit of this. We're just going to go ahead and start a new game. So I actually saw this beginning of this game like maybe 42,000 times. I think around about 42,000 times I saw the beginning of this game. Because I had to keep renting it and restarting it. And then when I finally bought the game, you know when I bought this game, a rental copy of it was slotted into my Super Nintendo back in my room the day I bought it. Isn't that nice? Love this game. It was wild to me to have music just so timed to the events that were occurring on the screen. The Opera House segment comes in late. I didn't get to the Opera House until rental number four of this game. Uh, interestingly. Because uh, I had to keep restarting the game. And that Zozo. You ever been to Zozo? That Zozo place is too hard. It was too hard for somebody who was rushing through the game because they were. The War of the Magi. I think it's still alive. I love that they call her a sorcerer. So I ended up never actually playing through this game in Japanese, though I did plug it in to my Super Famicom, one of the first things I did in my Japanese apartment. I bought Final Fantasy VI for about $3, and I also bought a copy of Dragon Quest V. Just loose cartridges. Plugged them in. Just plugged them right on in. And I played them. A little bit. 
And the thing that blew my mind was to see the name Final Fantasy VI on the title screen. That really, really shredded my mind. I loved it. And just how sophisticated of an introduction is this? And this music, the game has a piece of music like this. And it chooses to wait until after a dialogue-y cutscene to reveal it. It has a piece of music like this in its back pocket. And that, ultimately, is the magic of Final Fantasy VI. Is most of it, it keeps it itself, it keeps in its own back pocket. It's in no rush to reveal itself. It's in no rush to show you everything it's got. It reveals itself in time, starts very small, gradually pyramids out, and then it hits upon just a, a god darn steady drum beat of big, big milestone moments. Not just big milestone moments where I'm talking there's twists and turns in the story. I mean, there's just some straight up structural kabooms, I would say. Where the game just, game just yells. And it says, look at this, you've never seen this. You've never seen something like this. And it's not just graphics. It was so confident in its graphics and its music and so confident in everything it did. And we talk a lot about Final Fantasy VII. We talk about Final Fantasy VII being this turning point where Squaresoft RPGs became mainstream. I feel like this was, uh, this was so close. You know, it was so close. Oh, there's Ted Woolsey, Big Ted. Big Daddy Ted. So we've started the game now. The very first environment we enter is much more serious and dense looking than Final Fantasy, anything in Final Fantasy IV was. Anything in, we hadn't played Final Fantasy V in the US. We'd seen it in video game magazines. Unless you were blind or dumb, you had seen Final Fantasy V in video game magazines. You had seen it. And I'm gonna be honest, I was a weirdo and I was an idiot back then, more so than now. And I, uh, I didn't really think Final Fantasy V looked all that good. I just kind of thought it looked kind of dumb. I mean, I, I wanted to play it. I wanted very badly to play it. I just, I didn't think it looked great. I mean, eventually when I did play it, I was, I found myself quite disappointed with its story. Though I, to this day, I, I just, I adore its mechanics. I really wish we had a good... They should have put that on this SNES classic. That would have been wild. I think Square has to... Because Final Fantasy VI of all the Final Fantasies got done, I think, the most dirty with its remake. Because they added uh, this kind of uh, Malaysian clip art aesthetic look where everything's just kind of this weird hand-drawn stuff. Pixels are the wrong size. It's blobby as heck. I think Square Enix, to restore some good faith, needs to release their own mini console. Put some PlayStation games on there. There's a guy named Goddarn Butts in Final Fantasy V. Butts or Barts? Notice uh, this very tactical combat here. Very tactical combat. Now, I'm of the mind that real-time combat in Final Fantasy is, is not good from a design standpoint. And... I could defend this, and I promise I could make you believe me. I still love it. I, I, I love playing these games. I love going back and playing them, though it's... I really think if it was turn-based, I think if you get like a Final Fantasy X timeline-style turn-based battle system, I think you're now you're playing with power at that point. I can... Uh, I can't... I can't actually... I mean, like, well, this is not very tactical up front. Final Fantasy games that are with real-time combat always express the the weight of this burden. This burden to contain sophistication. You know? You know what I mean. Whereas you get into the early battles and they force some element of tacticality into them. 
Yeah. We're going to put the combat on active. We're going to put the battle speed on fast. We're going to put the message speed on fast. Should have done that earlier. I absolutely love playing this on the SNES Classic. I feel like a lot of video games I'm going to... I don't care how retro they are. I want my Xbox One Elite controller. I want like a modern controller. I, uh... Nobody in the chat gets to god darn tell me that uh, I'm wrong when I say old controllers suck. Because a lot of the old controllers just kind of do suck. I got I got big meat hook hands. You know what I mean? I got large grown man hands. They are gross. I remember once looking at, a, at Keith Richards. He had these big old weird hands. And I was like, oh god, that's horrendous. Well, I got those now. I, I can't help it. Just veins on them, just big old weird hands. I can't really grip these controllers as well as my tiny fleshy paws could back in 1994. I was 15 years old and I looked seven, okay? I love the old controllers and I love, I gotta admit, it is throwing me head first backward into 1994 to feel the plastic on this controller. They got the plastic quality perfect. It's, uh, plastic is this? Is it PP? Is it, uh, I think it's PP. Is it polypropylene? I don't know. Tell me what plastic it is. I mean, Ghost Little says, that, is it weird that when I met Tim at PAX East once and I thought, well, this dude has weird hands? Yeah, dude. I got weird hands. I got the, uh, I essentially, like, okay, here's, 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 I'm going to say something and it's going to sound dumb, but I promise I'm not bragging. I have the same body type, roughly, as Arnold Schwarzenegger. I have the same makeup, the same bone structure. It's just, I, I don't work out 1800 hours a day, or at least however many hours it was he used to work out. So my, my, my hands are basically begging for my forearms to be gigantic. That's what's wrong with my hands. Ooh, 007 makes an appearance. Fans of numerology will have a lot to love about the Japanese role-playing game genre. Ooh. And I will say that for the first time in Final Fantasy, we were able to really see Yoshitaka Amano's art style in, in this game. And if, if you had bought the game or you rented it from a, from a caring place that was curatorial enough to include an instruction manual not tattered or pressed into toilet paper smoothness by the hands of greedy, greasy, ghostly renters many times passed with inclinations to name the characters profanities and such. Ah, I'm drinking a Diet Dr. Pepper. Shout out to Doug Jones. We were able to finally see the art, and if you had seen the manual, the manual was... What's the word? The manual was fast a blast. Bonk a hog with the Oshinaka Amano art, which the box had very restraintively demonstrated. This is a goddarn my kingdom for a speed this thing to goddarn heck up. Again, if this were turn based, these animations are a little too slow. Look, I'm not gonna nitpick Final Fantasy 3. It's it's hard to begin talking about how how aggressively, viscerally, psychedelically this game made me scream when I first played it. Notice how I turn my heal. Look at this. I go I go into heal force. I can't tell who needs healing because it covers up the menu. That's why you got to turn on the. Uh, got to got to get it on mobile so it has that weird little touch interface. No, don't ever get it on the mobile. Don't get the mobile version of this game. If you want to play this game. And uh, I feel like I've been asked this question before, so I'm going to tell you, if you want to play this game, buy an SNES Classic, if you don't already have one. That's the best way to play it. Because then you get a whole bunch of stuff as well. You get a bunch of other games, man. That's the best way to play it. Do not try to play it on Steam or mobile. Don't tell me somebody patched something in. Do not tell me that. For $59.99 at pretty much any Target in America, 
you can buy Final Fantasy 3 right now. Whereas when I, that's for fifty nine ninety nine, you can get Final Fantasy three and all that comes with it. Really wish Final Fantasy two was on here. I'd even say Mystic Quest. Give me Mystic Quest. I want a SquareSoft mini console. Come on, it's with all their SNES games on there. Hey SquareSoft, if you're watching, I know you're called Square Enix now. I'm gonna call you SquareSoft because we're we're in nineteen ninety four mode. Um, for just for a low price, I will uh. I will translate every old SNES RPG for you. And then you can put even the ones that were not translated onto a little mini console. Put Treasure Hunter G on there. Put Rudra's Treasure, Bahamut Lagoon, uh, Live Alive, Romancing Saga 2, Romancing Saga 3. I will do all of them. And then you can put them on a mini console and, and release them in America. That would do bonker burger dollars. Fans like me would hamburger their way all the way through all of those games. Everybody, uh, spam Square Enix's Twitter. I mean, spam them like they were god darn Hawaii's favorite snack. He's going into his shell, and that's okay. When he goes into his shell, you do this. You heal. You heal everybody. You make sure everybody's not thirsty anymore. So like I said, all all Final Fantasy games with a real-time battle system, they you, you can sense this this burden to, to show off their, show their sweat, basically. They're 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 trying to they're they're showing you a hustle by giving you a tactical battle right up front. Whereas by tactical it means there's times to attack and there's times to not attack. And when his head goes in his shell, don't attack. And it's like this is the sort of tactic that does not really come into play elsewhere in the game. It does actually. There's there is a boss later. There is a boss later. Oh, we're gonna get hit with Mega Bolt. I gotta put my Dr Pepper down so that I can. Uh, Oh, I actually I went straight to magic because I'm straight up in playing the full, full butt game mode. So now you just do this. Basically what it ends up with is if you're on active mode, you just hang out in the menu and do this. I'm going to admit, 1994, the night of October 21st, 1994, my first ever rental of this game. Because it was out at Video Vault when I first saw it, and it was out that Friday night. Friday, October 14th. 1994, you know what I did that night? You know what I did? Everybody take a guess, what did I do on the night of Friday, October 14th, 1994? Somebody in the chat, I'm gonna give you all, until this, uh, until this idiot comes out of his shell, tell me. What do you think I did? Don't make any lewd remarks, please. Played DKC? No, DKC wasn't out yet. Another guess. Friday, October 14th, 1994. Eight macaroni and cheese? Technically, a uh, yes. Massive, massive, big boy consumption style. Oh, we're about to get hit. Somebody's gonna attack, and then the goddamn guy's gonna hit us with the goddamn mega bolt. Wore my sweatpants? I wore my sweatpants. Look, I'm talking about something specific. Watched Friday the 13th a day late. Good joke. Reread the reviews for the game in game magazines. You bet your butt, Beefarino. Formed an incorrect blitz input? No, because I didn't have the game yet. Watch Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't in, 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 indulge myself in babies' entertainments anymore. I found myself above a lot of cartoons at that point in my life. You know what I was doing at at age 15? We had read. Oh, we're gonna get that Mega Volt again. Where's the I get it button when you got darn need it? No, we're not gonna get it. We're, not gonna get it. we're okay. We uh. I mean, we had read A Tale of Two Cities in ninth grade, and we were reading The Mayor of Casterbridge in 10th grade. I'd already finished every book on the syllabus for 10th grade English class. I was rereading uh, A Tale of Two Cities, but not not just on 19, in 1994, October 14th, 1994. There was something else I did that night. And again, this is the first night I failed to rent the game. It was out on the Tuesday. My mom wouldn't let us rent games on Tuesday anyway. Would not let us rent games on Tuesday. I don't see anybody guessing it. There was no internet in 1994. Well, there was internet. We didn't have no internet. I had Doom, though. And no, I didn't have a job yet because I was too young to work at the Target. 
Well, I will now tell you what I did. October 14th, 1994. My dad knocked on my bedroom door. No, my mom knocked on my bedroom door, sorry. And she said, don't you want to go to the movies with your dad and brother? And I was bonker bone tired. I was like dead tired. It was like 7 p.m. I usually went to bed at about 4 p.m. Woke up at about 6 a.m. Uh, so what I did was I then did a bunch of push-ups so I could get ready to lift the controller adequately to play Final Fantasy 3 eventually. No, that's not true. What we did was we went and saw God Darn Pulp Fiction. Come on, everybody. God Darn Pulp Fiction. And let me tell you, you want to talk about God Darn Formative Experiences? An explosive one-two punch? I'd never seen God Darn anything like that in my life. A story with just three episodes that are... Sort of connected, sort of not connected. Main character changing. Little snippet at the beginning that you forget about and then it comes back in the end. A story where you don't even know where the point is the, at the end and it's a they, they make you laugh at a guy getting his head blown off. And brains going everywhere. They make you laugh at it. You can't, you can't escape laughing at it. John Travolta dancing on the screen. People just talking about nothing. Like an episode of Seinfeld with gunshot wounds. You know? I just shot Marvin in the face, man. Winston Wolf? This this bad butt guy in a suit who's at some sort of a funeral parlor reception at 6 o'clock in the morning? Goes in and uh, employs expertise uh, by informing people that they could put some blankets on the back of their bed, their, their, their car to make it not look like it's full of blood. Le Big Mac, Royale with cheese. I mean, buddy, it, it's just complete wild. And uh, that was me. Oh, and finally, I'm in control of a person character. You know, I remember. I remember someone being cynical. I remember my brother being like, this game looks dumb. It looks just like Final Fantasy 2, man. It's like, no. This so... I want to use the word abruptly. It so abruptly does not look anything like Final Fantasy 2 slash 4. The characters are so much bigger. They have so much more detail. So yeah, I went to see Pulp Fiction. Changed my god darn life. And, uh... It made me... I, I had already been trying to write short stories and little novellas and... I mean, here I am applying the word little to them. I'm diminutizing the work that I was attempting to do. And uh, I'd already been trying to do that stuff, and it just kind of changed my thinking radically about what the rules of storytelling were. I mean, you know, I eventually experienced uh, much better movies than Pulp Fiction, though at the time, a god darn kid whose little brother's addicted to Power Rangers and god darn cartoons, Super Mario Brothers, Super Show, god darn, I was, I was a 15-year-old baby child. You know? I was a bibby chibless. So. I'm telling you. Anyway. A week later. October 21st, 1994. I finally. I succeeded at renting. This here. Vid game. And this impressed me so much. These little fade to blacks. The sprite on black with the description. Of the person. A mysterious young woman, controlled by the Empire, and born with the gift of magic. We get to name her, and I'm going to give you my policy. Do you know my policy? Here it is. You give her the name like that. No, 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 sorry, sorry. Ted Woolsey be darned. Ted Woolsey's affectation was to name her Tara. I'm going to give her her, her J name, which is Tina. We're going to go J names this playthrough. It's not going to be that much different. Impressive. I've never heard of anyone recovering this fast. Quickly, Ted. So right now I've just arrived at the end of a very, very long procedure of translating a genuine 1990s role-playing game. Maddeningly large amount of text. And I got to tell you, 
I now sympathize fully with Ted here. Every single line, he had to manually insert line breaks. So he had to know, give us back the girl and the line break empire's magitech armor. So he had to know where the line break was going to be and he had to put it in there. And usually he had to do it on a computer without being able to look at the game until days later. So he just had to guess all these and then must have been a mind bender. You get the feel for it after about a couple dozen hours. Open this door. We want the girl. She's an officer of the Empire. So he had to just know that she's an officer of the Empire. That's about as many characters as he can fit. Because the, the letters in the font aren't all the same. Yes, I, I, I did my best to get the closest font to this into the game, Moon. Because I believe this is the most pleasant of the pixel fonts in English. You're hearing it. You heard it here first. Final Fantasy VI's English pixel font is the most pleasantly readable pixel font. And it could just be because I treated this game like my god darn income taxes when I was a kid. Learned god darn everything. Mastered the grid. I just, I, I stared so much at these item menus. And I mean, we don't really have too much going on in there right now. Not too much. Relics. They call them relics. You know, I really need to play this game in Japanese. God darn it, I'm going to do it, aren't I? I'm going to play this game in Japanese. She's up there. I emailed Ted Woolsey um, back when I was working on my Final Fantasy VII series because I thought he might know, be able to get me in touch with the translator of Final Fantasy VII. And, uh, spoiler, he did. But after I was done with the whole thing. We're not going to talk about that. And I asked him if he would ever if he's ever in New York, if he would want to come in and play Final Fantasy VI in Japanese with me and try to guess uh, what his translations were and do a live translation of it. And he said, that sounds fun. Six months later, uh, he has not replied to say, that so actually, that sounds so fun. Let's do it right now. I have faith he'll do it with me someday. Everybody, don't, do not spam Ted's Twitter. He doesn't even look at his Twitter that much. Uh, I gotta say, when I met Ted Woolsey for the first time, it was in 2013, because we were pitching a game to Microsoft Game Studios, and he was in charge of uh, Xbox Live Arcade stuff, when they still called it Xbox Live Arcade. And I, uh, I was immediately impressed with the guy. The guy's hilarious. Seems like he's had a life. Seems like a real individual. Just like a, you know, a real, it's a real doodly dude, you know? Oh, Tina gained a level. I, I got weirded out for a second. I was like, who's Tina? And Woolsey named her Tara. And yeah, if I were to have Woolsey right here in the goblin bunker, you better believe he'd get bunker grilled. But that's a door I can't open. I'll open that later. Final Fantasy VI does a good job of reusing its environments. Affording you opportunities to obtain familiarity with them. You know what? You chumps are going to get punked. Chew my hamburger. Bobbing for burgers. Put that apple in the bucket. He throws his wrench as he dies. See, I wonder, uh, see, so I'm translating that backward. The little grease monkey guy throws his wrench at you when he dies uh, as like a revenge move. Like, uh, I'm hoping that the Japanese name is Uribenchi. It's a little, little tidbit of what I would do if I was in charge of translating stuff. Repo Man. Yeah, he's Repo Man. I call him Gre Grease Monkey. He's like, there's another variety. So here we go. This is good. All right. My sweet little magic user. Wee hee hee. So we know two things about Kefka. Uh, he diminutizes women. Sweet little magic user. Uh, then also he laughs like a god darn pig. And if he laughs like a pig, he's a cop. He straight up says he's gonna own me. You know, buddy, what is this? Is this Quake? We going around? I'd take this clown downtown is what I'd do. Kefka wants to go around with me. 
he'd better pack a god darn rhinoceros worthy lunch. You know what I mean? I'm gonna just leave that there. Everybody loves this music, right? How how beautifully it segues. We've got this little ducking effect on here, so if I shut up for a second, you can hear the music. You want to try this out? Listen to this. Pretty good, huh? Wee hee hee, good up burn up everything. A lot of arson. I recently uh, researched arson in the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. I went through newspapers.com, a subsidiary of ancestry.com. Read through a whole bunch of newspapers. You type arson, 1994, you end up with a lot of arson. A lot of people light things on fire. Must have been all that Beavis and Butthead on the television back then. Saying fire is cool. I remember being told. Beavis and Butthead was uh, rewriting my, my morals with their talk of metal. Someone is asking, uh, Chrono Kid says, who's your favorite Final Fantasy villain? You know what? I like this dumb Kefka guy. I think he's got a good story. Because I think there's more to him. Where did he come from? Right? He's the result of an experiment. He's a human who has been artificially infused with magic. Though we don't really know. We know that he was a result of an experiment, and he feels some sort of animosity toward his, uh, his mage fathers. Took you long enough. How goes the robbing and plundering trade? How goes? Uh, he's just, he's surprised to be insulted. I think if you want to go around in your life committing what some call crimes, you should, uh, drop the act. Don't be so surprised. Treasure hunter and trail-worn traveler. Searching the world over for relics of the past. I'm going to tell you something about Locke. Locke Cole. John Locke. As we call him, where I'm from. Something about him. I feel like he has aspects of his vocation that the game does not really explore. Semantic nonsense. There's a huge difference between thief and treasure hunter, he says. He's supposed to be, uh, I take it this way. I think he's supposed to be like an Indiana Jones kind of guy because he's a treasure hunter and a trail-worn traveler. Oh, we get a little bit of the speed. He moves quickly because he wants to talk about a girl. Imperial dot, 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 witch. Three exclamation points. Notice the exclamation point before the question mark up at the top. I noticed that a lot in Final Fantasy VII. When translating the game Moon, I've noticed that every exclamation mark question mark or every exclamation question exclaim it question they're all all of them it's the exclamation mark first so i feel like that's the the japanese punctuation style whereas in english not that we double up on punctuation too colloquially in this particular language we're not quite so playful as you know a relative outsider would be we usually put the question mark first right Right, everybody? We got Michael D. McGrath saying that uh, question mark, or exclamation mark, question mark means uh, interesting, and question mark, exclamation mark means dubious. There's this, uh, this little, little tiny space between curiosity and dubiosity. Everybody used the word dubiosity somewhere today. Oh, Kupo? So I wonder about Kupo. I wonder if it's supposed to be like a... Like a, a sort of a, a dog-like exhalation of a sort. Kupo. Or if it's just them saying, Kupo. I don't think it's them. Use us to save Tina from the guards. I love this uh, tutorial. Need, need more information? Yeah, let's go ahead and see how they... You'll fight using three different groups. Press the Y button to switch between them. First of all, big boy sitting on the floor, 19-inch sharp television, big coily headphones plugged into the stereo, uh, playing this game. October 21st, 1994, deep into the night, somewhere around about 10 p.m. Everybody else is at the homecoming football game, and I'm there 
in the cold, in the dark, in the sweatpants, in my Donkey Kong Country pre-order shirt. This is blowing my mind. I'm like, what is this? It lets me switch between my parties. The job is to defeat the commander. They're trying to reach Tina. Absolute, absolute mind bender. My mind was looking like a god darn pretzel. I was hanging out with a god darn balloon donkey. It's a donkey made balloon animal style. Let's get this Moogle right here. That's Mog. So notice Mog has the massive number of HP. Mog is an enigmatic character. Uh, he's a real bro, and he fights hard, and he screams loud, and when he dies, at least two people cry. Mog is tough, and he's beautiful. He's enigmatic because he he leads these Moogles that we don't really know where he's from, you know? We don't really know what his deal is. We don't know why he's so strong, why he's so cool. He's never given an opportunity to speak friend and enter into, you know, the actual story of the game. He's an optional character. You can come back and get him. Kryko. Looks like Cuckoo's uh, going Coco Puffy. He's got 5 HP left. 120 GP. They call it GP because they don't really know. Oh, Kushu. Kudin. Kudu. Camog. Got one tonic, one potion. Somebody's gonna... We got we got basically one Core's Light, and then we got one Colt 45. That's all we've got to kind of uh, just call it a party. You can't really call it a party. Not ethically, anyway. Lock, Kupet, Kupop, Kumama. We got a preemptive attack. There's so many words I encountered in this game that, uh... Not necessarily that I had never seen them before. Again, I was no stranger to literature. Seeing repeated usage of the word. God dang. Words like preemptive. See, I feel like my guy's back was turned. I should have gotten into a fight there. I, I should have gotten a back attack. So the wilderness here, to me, what, what tore my brain asunder, what turned the contents of my skull into goddamn pulled pork was... An RPG like a Final Fantasy, where there's monsters on the map, right? Monsters on a goddamn map. Someone in the chat is saying, Mog. Oh my god, I keep trying to switch back to Mog's party so I can move him out of the goddamn way. Don't kill my little boy. You killed my goddamn child. Look at that stupid idiot. Don't you dare. Oh, Mog just wasted the drink. God, it's every little weirdo for himself up in here. Let me use the Dusk Requiem. Oh, he's using the Tusk Requiem. Oh, he's dead. That's actually what death looks like and what it sounds like. No, he's not dead. What? Yeah, Cave-In does, like, more damage over time. Yeah, Seventh Saga let you see Matt. Look, okay, there were some... There were some monsters visible on screens prior to this. Well, now they're all just goddamn dead. Uh, I'm gonna take his. Uh, I I hate robbing the little boy, but if you take his stuff, then he gets. Uh, you can just give that stuff to Edgar, and he's it's slightly better for him. I hate saying it. Someone said in the chat that Gogo, Umaro, Mog, and Shadows like the DLC party. That's true. However. I challenge you to accept and understand that Shadow is actually the most important character in this video game. And if you haven't played this game, I really think you should. I think of all the Final Fantasies, I, I get people asking me lately if they should play Final Fantasy VII on the Nintendo Switch or they should play, or if they should just wait for the remake. Everybody talks about waiting for the remake. Um, I think you, you might as well just wait for the remake. The remake's probably gonna be good. Mithril Shield really puts Locke all the way up there. And uh, Koopak, Koopop, Koomama, they're kind of a bunch of idiots. So, we really don't... He doesn't have any relics on. We're going to go ahead and uh, fling ourselves at the feet of this boss. This boss kind of sucks. You can choose to take him on. I feel like I... In the past, I usually just used Mog's party. 
Interestingly, Mog is one of the first characters you get to play as in the game. Who... Ooh! Kryko! Lord! These boys don't chump down, huh? Lordy! Killing my boy. Look what they did to my boy. Look what they did to my boy. That's not actually, you're not gonna live. He vendettaized him for my favorite number of the damage. You know what? Put your cards on the table, big chump. Lord! This guy is like acting like he has something real to prove. All he's gonna prove is what it looks like when a body hits the floor. Marshal, is that a name or a military rank? Don't care. You got 24 experience points. That's actually pretty good. Let me use those for something. Potion. Yeah, I'll drink that. 410 GP. Somebody somebody typed Koo Mama into the chat and it got it got held by the Moobot Automod for uh, because it, it was perceived as sexual. I gotta admit, I've heard a lot of dirty words in my years. Basically, I I chew through words like a god darn horse through an oat bucket. I look for them, you know? I mean, it's all about there's a... Uh, there's a looseness one acquires when when you really need it, you know? And I've never heard Kumama used in a sexual context. Uh, though now you have my curiosity. You saved me. Save your thanks for the Moogles. Locke is a weirdly Canadian in my mind. Can't remember anything past or present. Wait, can't remember present? Crikey, how are you talking? You have amnesia. Amnesia is a thing. Locke won't leave her until her memory returns, and it's two exclamation points is how you know he's telling the truth. The secret entrance might be useful someday. Don't forget about it. Absolutely love this, because later, the character, Terra, under the player's control, is going to have to remember this little secret entrance. And uh, I love that. Look at that. Kaboom. She's going to have to remember that later. Let me go up to this Dickensian fellow here. Classroom for the beginner. Think of us as your advisors. I'm only going in here to pillage the items. I'm a big, big boy. I just sipped from the oat bucket. I failed to get the elixir from the clock, though we'll be back here. And Lord knows I don't ever use elixirs in Final Fantasy, because only narcs actually drink the elixirs. Kaboom! Something about it, me age 14, I could not stand the idea of drinking an elixir. Get out! Ooh, a tincture. Words one had not encountered. Give me a sip. Oat bucket. I'm gonna bury my face in the oat bucket. Oh, nothing there. <laughs> That's what I think whenever uh, I look in a pot in one of these old schooling and RPGs. Someone in the chat was saying before the stream started that they would love to see this game remade in the graphical style of Octopath Traveler. And I'm like, yeah, I would like it to be 60 FPS. Because I don't know if you've noticed, this is 60 frames per second. And I need people to stop telling me that RPGs don't need to be 60 FPS, because they do. And that's all there is to it. Someone says these guys are all Ewan McGregor in the Star Wars prequels. Ewan McGregor also in the Obi-Wan TV show coming soon to Disney Plus or whatever it's called. They're not going to let me go in here. So I played... A lot of Final Fantasy IV. Played it over and over again. This is the pits. We better hightail it southward to Figaro. Man. I love his... Uh, like wh wh who, who is Woolsey conjuring in this character lock? Anyway, I'd seen technology in Final Fantasy IV. We'd seen plenty of technology. 
plenty of it. Plenty. We'd seen plenty of it. Though it was always weird, shiny anime, sort of, you know, Galaxy Express looking stuff, just shiny. Star Wars even. So seeing this uh, very relatable gear and pulley system, this glowing furnace just kind of wild blowing smoke. And then here we go. We now experience the exit. I like this. The music does not change. We just hear the Narsh music continuing. And this slightly tilted Mode 7 world map, it's, uh, it's gregariously stupid. Attempting to impress the child that was me. And succeeding with aplomb. Let's cast a fire spell on these idiots. One thing one learns, uh, I found myself playing RPGs ultra conservatively back in my teen years. And if you were to watch me play Dragon Quest now, you'd throw up because I'm just, I'm casting every magic spell every round. I'm just going wild. I feel like when you get to a certain point and you've played enough Persona games, and I'll admit, I played Persona 1, like, I played it right away when it first came out. Uh, because I'm a jerkweed. And I had a PlayStation. And I was loud about what I needed. You know, I think it's cool that you died uh, that way, though I'm going to make you guys die this way. Oh. Well, hecko. Didn't exactly go how I thought it would. So I, once you've played enough games like Persona, and then you just you get bolder in the decision making. Not that that was illustrated anywhere here. Though to think, I, I would have never... At age 15, I would not have, like, used magic. What you got is conserve your magic. And, and then, you know, once you play Bravely Default, you're just like, heck yeah, buddy. And here we are, Town of Figaro. Still, music has not changed. So it's not actually the Narsh theme music. It's it's just kind of the, uh, the down in the dumps, the pits music. It's the pits music. Here we go. Ready? Now we go inside. You ready for this? Yeah. Music hits you like god darn air conditioning. You know? So we got a couple of things we can do. Figaro Castle engine room. Ready to leave at a moment's notice. Figaro Castle's a vehicle. I always entertained this fantasy as a child of uh, living in a vehicle whether it was a boat at sea or such. So there's thieves. So you see the guy down there, the wolf in the lower right. Lone wolf. The thief. It's like a wolf man. He's important later, though only in a tenuous side questy nature. Because you get, you get Mog in your party through a weird, glitchy event that involves Lone Wolf, the thief. I've heard of God save the king, but go see the king? GSTK, everybody, welcome back. Doon, 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 doon. Love this music. I like these little shops. It's like on the way, on the walk up to the king. Uh, there's just a couple stores. We got a soft. So, like, look at, I've got 5,400. 75 GP. Notice that's a lowercase p, which always creepied me out. That's a lot of money to have at the beginning of a game. They really, uh, they beefed up those numbers. They had some big wig in a, in a suit. Probably a suit that didn't fit. Walk in and go, we gotta get those numbers up. And they thought he was talking about the amount of gold that enemies give you. 5,745 jeeps. This is amazing to have a shop. So look at this. We didn't know how good we had it back on the old soup nint days. Because we didn't realize we could just do this. Like, check this out. Ready? I want you to just notice the remarkability of this. Kaboom! Okay, let's do that again. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's like 12 frames to get in there. It's not 12 frames. 
Maybe maybe it's like 28 frames. Half a second. Half a tick around the old Jerry wheel. That's what they call clocks in Final Fantasy world. It's just amazing to have this uh, the King's Chamber up there and then these purchasing zones right here. Talk about a chamber of commerce. Just this little tiny shop. What needs the king with this nonsense? Auto crossbow noise blaster. And I love how you get these items, right? You can click on them to see what they say. I'm saying click on them. Back then we would have said select them. Edgar's tool system is like wickedly overpowered. You get him the chainsaw eventually. And then you're just killing. You can kill about as much as you can chill. So, man, you mean this young woman? Oh, man, yeah, he's a... He just wants to talk about a lady. Certain type of man who wears a cape definitely wants to talk about a lady. Who do you think you are? How do you think she pronounced that? Oh, my God. How rude of me to turn my back to a lady. You know, I'm gonna say it. He, uh... He just shouldn't have done it. Like, I mean, if, if, if he thinks it's rude, why did he do that within, like, eight seconds of meeting her, right? I think Edgar, he fancies himself a ladies' man, to be sure. Though, I mean, how much of a ladies' man are you really when you commit some sort of a weird little politeness etiquette crime like that? So Edgar's name in Japanese actually is Edgar, if I'm not mistaken. It is Ed Edgar, right? Like, master designer of machinery. So he's got a couple of things going on. He's a king, he's an ally, and he's a, a designer of machinery. We're just going to call him Edgar. Is that pronounced Edgar or Edgar? Kaboom! Hi, my name is Bleb Blebker. What did you say? Surprised someone like me knows a king? No, usually, uh. Actually, no, I'm not gonna. I don't. I don't really know. He's a designer of machinery. He's a mechanical engineer. No, he's not a mechanical engineer. He's just a guy who designs some machines. He probably just like draws the machines and then he gets the engineers to design them. And then they, that's why they sell them to them. I'll give you three reasons. First of all, your beauty has captivated me. Second, I'm dying to know if I'm your type. Oh my God. Isn't she supposed to be like 16 years old? I guess your abilities would be a distant third. Somebody fact check that. How old is Taratina? She, uh, 16 or 18? So my technique's getting a bit rusty. Just like your machines. Engineer punk. I suppose a normal girl would have found him dashing, but I'm hardly normal. That's what Tara says to herself. And those guys are just kind of standing there, like just awkwardly, like looking at their feet, being like trying to not, trying to not, you know, I'm going to make her just walk like a, like a champion. I'm just going to go in here. Uh, does Edgar come with an auto crossbow? Oh, she's 18. She's 18 years old, everybody. Still kind of creepy. How old is Edgar? Is Edgar like 48 or something? Like, he's, no, he's not. He's like, how old are all these characters? So I actually never thought of this. I, when I played this game, I just thought they were all like 30 years old. I just thought everybody was like 30. Because, uh, I had a childishness complex. I considered myself uh, a babby chibless, a, a, a bibby mimbus, like a loser. I considered myself some kind of a punk moron and that every character in a video game or story that I liked was clearly older than me in addition to cooler and more mature. Edgar has a twin brother. He was such a nice boy. Fade. Oh my god. Hey bro. 
I got a ponytail. Brother, what's wrong with father? What's all this talk of his successor? Are you blind? Look how thin his face has become. Huh? What is it? Brother! Oh my god, Edgar. Tears? Oh, just wonderful cutscene. Wonderful cutscene. Edgar's twin brother, who traded the throne for his own freedom. Sabin? Pronounced like, like log cabin? Sabine? Sanguine? I don't know what his name is supposed to be. There's only one name that I gave him. I've given him this name every playthrough of this game I've done since, uh, since I god darn got an internet connection and learned that things were different across the big lake. So his name is Mash. Mash. And that's a cool name, man. His name should have just been Mash. Yes. His name is Mash. Oh, he looked so like his father. When he ran away, he was a sweet little child. I wonder what he's like now. He's a big boy with beef arms. He put some steak on his shoulders. My highness said he'd marry me when I get older. Okay, so this. I'm sure that, uh, what do you call it? He was, uh, he was just, you know, humoring a little girl. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that she was just kind of, you know, she put him in a spot. <sighs> that is a little creepy just to look at. Because uh, you just got to kind of, when it's plain text like that, you just got to take it for truth. You know? Maybe they didn't name Sab and Mash because they knew that the first NPC you would get to if you went up from the room where you name him is uses the word smash and they didn't want you to get confused. They didn't want you to think that the Empire has the King's brother the three cities. That's probably it, actually. I'm just kidding. It's definitely not it. What sort of sort of clocks can I get stuff out of here? Hey, what's up, buddy? What's your bird doing? It's a figure of the desert castle. God. You know, this guy gets paid to do that, to just tell people the name of the city and, like, what kind of place it is. That's what I need. What's, uh... Just having a good time in the castle. So the castle, with very minimum... Very minimalisticness, sparsely, it communicates itself as a place. So this guy, you walk up to him and he just poindexters at you. And he's surrounded by bookshelves, so we know oh, there's a castle library. Poindexters the world over are doing research on magic. Said they people those poindexters. <laughs> Nobody actually says scholars in the world, right? Right? Everybody just calls them Poindexters. It's okay to say Poindexter, right? It's not some sort of... There's there's no, like... Nobody's weaponized that term for as hate speech yet, have they? Like, let me know. I gotta... I keep a checklist. So, it, it's okay. Okay, just making sure. I'll just sleep. I love being able to walk into the bed. When I was 15 years old, this game first came out, I, I love sleeping in a real bed. Big boy real bed. And man. So being able to just walk into all the beds. It's something I, I, I admired about Final Fantasy 2. I like a game that's got a good bedtime presentation. You know? A game that really puts sleep on the line and says, sleep is good. And I feel like one might one might muse if one is in the mood to uh, believe that it is some perfunctory addition to games that sleeping heals. Right? The succession was settled with a coin toss. 
Speaking of which, no, I have not watched the show Succession. I'm waiting for season two to end, and then I'm going to watch all of season one and two. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to bonker my burgers off. So again, one might think that sleeping in RPGs as a way of healing was a just a big shrug and an I don't know kind of decision. But I think there's wisdom there. I've found a night's sleep is good. More good than uh, others things might be. So basically the whole point of this event, and uh, this is, so this, this actually doesn't get enough credit in discussions about Final Fantasy VI, I don't think. And the, the, at the beginning of the game, it's already started strong, very cinematic in the beginning with operatic music, pieces that blend into one another, it takes you into a little set piece, makes you do a couple of scripted battles where you're fighting exclusively enemies that appear on the map and attack you on the map, and then you fight a boss that requires you to think at least a little bit tactically. And then you end up switching protagonists to someone else, taking over the perspective. So the, the perspective shifts to another character who then very quickly meets up with that character. So they introduce you to the idea of, of parting and reuniting. They are, where it wasn't really parting because we were introduced to them. So parting and reuniting is a big thing in this game. And it ends up being done over and over and over again through multiple cycles and repetitions. And that is how the game builds up its various catharsis that it's going to basically fire all at once into an enormous payoff at one point. So this game is now training you to hang out apart from your characters. So what it just made me do, this whole quote-unquote, you know, if one of the big wigs who doesn't understand video games comes into the room, they would call this a level. This level had no fighting in it. You were just supposed to, your, your objective was to hang out in the castle. And hanging out means talking to the old lady who tells you the story of the king's brother. And it's very subtle and it's very low key. And the player will discover this if they are curious. Very wonderful. So that, that little thing right there, it's a very tiny light touch. And Final Fantasy VI is just covered with a dusting of these little light touches. So now we're a, a, a visitor, a nuisance of a visitor is a alluded to here, and Edgar says it's probably Kefka, and we hear his music fade. And Kefka, we see Kefka as a sort of a prissy individual. Fooey, his first word spoken. Edgar, you pinhead. No, he, he spoke some words in a flashback before, though. His first in the flesh word. What do you have to make, why do you have to live in the middle of nowhere? These recon jobs are the pits. So much stuff is the pits in this game. I love this opera clown's got his just fancy prancy music going on. There's sand on my buttes. And they're going to wipe it off. Love that sound. Yes, sir. All set, sir. Oh, man. The salute motion that they have. Kefka's bizarre laughter. Idiots. Calls his assistants idiots. Oh, my God. He was so close to the castle. Oh, he gets... Watch this. Out of my way. If this were a remake of Final Fantasy VI. It would be like some elaborate jujitsu maneuver he does. Now, again, again, the game has just done something stylistically striking. So first of all, I meant to point this out earlier. Look at the nice dusting of sand on the tiles. You can actually suss out how many different types of ground tiles there are there. A little experiment for aspiring sprite artists in the, in the audience. The game scrolled up, revealing that they were in the middle of the desert, scrolled up to show the entrance to the castle. They come through the castle, whereas for us, we, we experience a cut into an interior and then a pop out into an exterior. Screen scrolls up, placing Edgar in the middle. Kefka at the very bottom. Geometrically perfect, this arrow. And it is immediately clear to the player that I'm in control of Edgar now. I had not been in control of Edgar before. I've never controlled Edgar. He has not entered my party until this exact point in the game. That's very interesting. The game has handed off control of the segment of story to another character outside of our purview. I love it. 
So here we go. I thought we were allies. So Edgar's about to betray his allies in the uh, the Empire, because the Empire's getting greedy. They're called troopers. Which I find interesting. Woolsey missed the Star Wars reference. And the names Biggs and Wedge. Called them Vicks and Wedge. Still called them troopers, like stormtroopers. What brings Kefka, humble servant of Emperor Gestal, into our lowly presence? A girl of no importance recently escaped from us. We heard she found refuge here. That's not Kefka's voice. If you've played Dissidia NT, you know Kefka's voice. And it's... It's really something. I gotta sneeze. <coughs> Crikey. Hmm. This wouldn't have anything to do with this witch everyone's been whispering about, would it? Pony lives. She merely stole a Bronco of minor value. Is she horse? That's, uh, I, I, I punched that up. Uh, if I were doing the translation, I would make Kefka mention a horse in every sentence. Someone said Gazuntite in the chat. I think you meant to say Gestaltite, because Gestalt's the name of the Emperor. Oh, that's a tough one. We're going to try to get us on some chocobos. I'd play this game all day. I would really love to just do a full, full butt playthrough of this game. Live on a stream. So there are so many little little set, piecer, set piecerly things that it does that I find ostentatiously, audaciously appealing leading up to the game builds up and allows us opportunity to hang out in a zone and experience a little bit of the world right uh, I ruined it I ruined it by turning the music back on and just hang out in the world I go up here what happens when I get up here there's lock I see that guy's missing a few buttons where's Tina Take her to her room. So Edgar leaves. Notice that Tina is now placed in the center of the screen. Right? Edgar says, follow me. I get to follow him in real time. It's luxurious. This is a very luxurious... So I have an opportunity, or I had an opportunity earlier to hang out and learn stuff about the world. I could have sped through... Though if I hang out, I'm rewarded with... I'm rewarded with deeper enjoyment of the story. You like the story more if you hang out and talk to all the people and learn all the stuff. Well, it's not really... He doesn't have much to learn. Not much to learn from that guy. What about this guy? I don't know if this is a case of some of the dialogue being cut. I would love to find out. Gotta play the Japanese version. So... You just hang out and you can learn stuff about the story and you build this, you, you build up, you just build up respect and admiration for the characters. And then when stuff starts happening, Treasure Hunter, he loves the distinction between thief and treasure hunter. Semantic nonsense, my boy. On the surface, Edgar pretends to support the Empire. The truth is he's collaborating with the Returners, an organization opposed to the Empire. I am his contact with that group. That's why he uh, hangs out with a scruffy ruffian. You're not a soldier of the Empire. They were using you. Things are different now. It's true. So she has to decide whether she should maintain allegiance for this group of <laughs> group of murderous psychos who were in, uh, enslaving her or if she should chill with the, the cool guys the big kids table somebody in the chat how uh how old is Kefka supposed to be we get a little fade we got Edgar here huh what the he runs eventually you'll be able to buy the sprint shoes relic that will let you uh, run everywhere oh my god nothing like flaming stone what's happening it's the Empire. They've uh, glued a couple flammable things to our rock and lit them on fire. I don't find this fire very convincing. So this is good. I'm Edgar again. Fire. 
Fire. Here we go. We get the Beavis and Butthead reference. Fire, fire. Heh heh heh. He's a hair's breadth away from saying fire is cool. Bring me the girl now. He doesn't know what they're talking about. Well, then, welcome to my barbecue. Ooh, ah, ha, ha, ha. Welcome to my barbecue. Welcome to my barbecue. So, here we go. We're just supposed to, like... I'm panicking now. I'm gonna panic. This is what they call role-playing. I'm playing the role of a scared king. Actually, I gotta move a lot faster to be scared. Notice those guys are definitely moving at 60 frames per second. Go up here. You need 60 frames a second when you're navigating menus. You just do. I'm sorry. Talk to this guy. Get ready. Yes, sir. Changed your mind? Kafka sucks. And he's just going to get punked. Oh, we get to hear Locke's music now. Find the, uh, the, 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 the motifs in the musically. Occasionally don't, uh, don't quite match up. Like, why are we hearing Locke's music? Locke's music is just the fun adventure theme. So this little set piece, uh, exists to establish the character of Kefka, establish Edgar's nature as a guy who's actually supporting a resistance. We don't really get too much of him as a king. I don't see him as a king, really. He's a young king. You know what they say about a young king. It's a dumb thing to have a young king. And then the castle goes under the sand. I remember that being a really big deal in the video game magazines that like covered this game. The castle goes under the sand. It's like, okay. I feel like a lot of the reviews, Jeff Lucky Laundry gets included, they only include screenshots from a very shallow early point in the game. So you get a fun little event here. You actually don't have to trigger this event. So I can actually have Terra fight. I mean, I can, I can just do, I can do that. However, if I use magic, these boyos are gonna freak out. Edgar, what's the matter? You look positively spooked. Did you just see what I saw? So they're like freaked out by the magic. You actually don't have to do this right away. Though, they will, uh... Oh, they make you press the button every time for magic. That's great. Oh, that's good, good whisper sounds. Hiso, hiso in Japanese. Where on earth did you learn that? Earth? We're on Earth? The planet doesn't have some weird name? Like Gladius or whatever? I like when Locke did that little jump, he landed on his... Or uh, Edgar did a little jump and he landed on his face and then he like got back up instantly. Me either. It's just that I've never actually seen magic before. Oh my god, and then this is good. Locke just comes in and is like... She can use magic and we can't. That's the only difference between us. He just like straight up uh, is the, like accepting of her. And they got thanked. Oh, we're, 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 stop swooning, as she's going to say. However, it's not actually attributed to her. So that event will occur whenever you decide to have Tina use magic with him in the party. I don't know if there's a point, if there's like a certain point in the game after which it, it locks off and you can't like access don't kick her okay that's it. god we're low on our, our hps here oh give me that victory give me that victory someone in the chat is saying 25th anniversary stream it launched 25 years ago today jp or na north america i'm talking about the anniversary of my playing this game came out in April of 1994 in Japan, so that means there was a six-month window. Incredible that it came out in the same year. Son of a submariner. They'll pay for this. This is great! I think he's referring to the idea of the birds. 
Was that a bad person? I'm scared. Wonderful dialogue. Someone I'd like you to meet. Okay, so they're going to take her to a... Uh... So wait, Locke just said we're members of the Returners. Though in the castle, Locke said that he was a member of the Returners who was Edgar's contact with the group. I like this road trip segment. Final Fantasy XV didn't do it first. These are just a couple of a couple of buds on a long trip. They're on a road trip. I'm really struck by just how fashionable and excellent the colors are of their outfits. It's very good, good little red, good little blend. That Esper seemed to react to her. Wait, who who knows the Esper? What? How do they? Know? The Esper seems to. Okay, I'm gonna stop editorializing on the dialogue. There's there's a little bit of a a little bit of a mess. No human is born with the powers you seem to have. Oh, you just, she does not react well to being called inhuman. Either that or the chocobo was scared to have an inhuman rider. So she was born with magical powers. And these other people have to engineer them. And that's the whole world build that's going on here. And magic is just a complete freak show. I actually am a big fan of this simplified user interface. If you look at the minimap in the corner, there's a red dot representing my location and a smaller red dot representing my facing direction. Someone in the chat is asking, what do I think of Ted Woolsey's Final Fantasy VI translation better than Seven's original script? So, is it better than Seven's original script uh, in English? So, I'm going to say, I need to, I have not played this game in Japanese, and I would like to. I've played it so much in English that uh, I never bothered to play it in Japanese. And I, I would. I actually meant to buy a Super Famicom Mini when I was in Japan a few weeks ago. I think that would just be a fun thing to have kicking around the house. I know you can get one online or whatever. It's just, it seemed like a thing to do. I had limited suitcase space and I thought this would be a cool thing to have. However, I didn't get it. Goodbye, Chocobo. We're going into Narsh again. I sure did just uh, hand bone that whole thing. We'll do a couple of kills. Or we'll go do a couple of dies. Oh, Locke is gonna die. Locke Cole. I love that his name is Locke Cole. It's a good name. I hamburger basketed that. I'm sorry. My Chocobo. I've heard Chocobo pronounced a million different ways. By the couple of people that I've known who've played this game. Ooh, I did not occasion to acquaint myself with too many people who played this game when I was younger. My neighbor, Keith, shout out to Keith, who uh, played a whole lot of Final Fantasy games. We played Final Fantasy VII in tandem. Played eight in tandem with one another. He pronounced it Chocobos. In Japanese, it would just be Chocobo, so that's how I pronounce it. I got yelled at. I got chewed out by the readership and the viewership for my uh, pronunciations of a few character names in my Final Fantasy VII series. Sephiroth. But I, I, I alternated between Sephiroth, Sephiroth. I alternated between pronunciations and then people just got mad at all of them whenever it suited them. How do I pronounce Sabin? I pronounce it like Cabin. Um, yeah, it was weird. Back then, we didn't know how to pronounce the names of characters in games because there was no voice acting. There's just voice acting in God darn everything right now. So I would I would pronounce it Sabin. Though I I uh, my my buddy Keith called him Sabin, and I'm sure some people call him Sabine. Weirdos call him Sabine. Here's another cave again. Oh, that ground texture is doing my eyeballs a swirly. King Edgar, where are you headed? More like King Edgar, where are you headed? Is Edgar some kind of a gross word? Am I not allowed to say that? It wouldn't happen to be a Swedish uh, 
profanity, would it? Edgar. Just let me know, please. Someone in the chat asked, how do I pronounce Aura Chalcum? Uh. Oh, little, little toidle. Give me the toidle, give me the toidle. You can't use the toidle yet. He's a swimmy little buddy in there, see him? Oh, immediately an encounter. A hornet in the blurry. I like these guys because they look like little god darn target practice. Here you go. Get an arrow in your eye. Here, come on, bucket muncher. Let's go. You know why I don't like horses? I'm going to be honest. It's because anything that eats with its head in a bucket, that's weird. And gives up awareness of its surroundings in the name of satiating its gluttony. A distrustful, muscular thing. Wild creature. You ever seen a wild horse? You ever had a wild horse like come up on you while you're just trying to do your taxes or whatever? Out in a meadow, somewhere you can think clearly with nice air. Wild horse comes running up. Starts making its cartoon whinny sounds at you. Just being like, ride me, ride me. And you're like, no, weirdo. Don't like wild horses. I'm just joking. That's never happened to me. No, I'm joking about that. It actually happens all the goddamn time. Oh. Really thought we were gonna... No, oh, she's asleep. I feel like Final Fantasy VI's combat is... I don't know. Maybe I'm just too chill with it. Oh, she got Ant Dot. That's good. I feel like... Final Fantasy VI's combat's just kind of frivolous. I love it. Though in terms of economics and such, I feel like you can just kind of ham fist and sausage finger your way to an early grave. By, by grave, I mean good time. I am going the wrong way. It's nice to have an environment that has a couple of little bendies in it, though, isn't it? Just a little bit of a bendy and a little bit of a twisty. That's all I ask for in a dungeon. Eventually, dungeons just became these big old straight lines. Remember that? Final Fantasy XIII. But we are just loading up on money. I got money like honey. 6924. <laughs> Let's put a seven on the end of that. And, we, uh, and we're uh, now we're talking, you know what I mean? Don't put a seven on the end of that number. Don't put a seven on there. Oh, and I love the step counter in this game. The step counter is wonderful. You get to look at it, and it's, it's just another metric. Just another metric. It's wonderful to just kill these monsters because they deserve it. Look at these ugly things. Crawlies? More like crawlers. Making me want a French donut. You know what I mean? A little bit of vanilla. I haven't had a crawler in a while. Nothing's cooler than a crawler. I'm just, uh, I'm mining the treasure out of this place. Yeah, the auto crossbow is way too strong. So, like, what you learn to do if you're a pro is you use the Y button to just switch. God, it's too strong. You just have an infinite insta-kill. So, and again, this is actually interesting-ish because we have these characters who each have a well, Locke doesn't really have anything overpowered. Locke is the everyman. So Tara's got her magic. And she can use it. You can use it if you want. 
If Edgar levels up like once, he's going to become capable of killing instantly any of these monsters in this cave. So they're, they're, they, they've let you hang out now in a friendly zone, and now you're hanging out, expressing your hangout conversation through battles. And in the battles, you're gonna, you learn the characters' personalities and how they reflect Ludo narratively, for better or for worse, on the performance of the characters and the characters' game design and how that, how that all just kind of meshes together to form uh, what we consider a good RPG character is a character who has personality in the story that reflects on their skill set in the more technical aspects of the game. And uh, we just learned that Edgar, Edgar's a little silver spoon born on a boat, kind of rich boy who just kind of gets his free ride. Look at that. And when you're hanging out with him, you don't got to pay for your burgers. You're going to God darn five guys, not McDonald's, when he's with you, right? So they're basically setting you up, climbing the roller coaster hill until you're going to get to a point where you don't have Rich Boy, where you've got these like three different parties. And that amounts to the truest, largest, loudest, ooh, loudest expression of greatness that Final Fantasy six will perpetrate on you is the split we assemble enough characters together and then they're on their way to an objective when a travesty occurs an accident happens and in such a lovely fashion the accident is not it's not on the it's not on the script per se it's not the accident is a, a big old dumb octopus attacks you. And the octopus is just, he's just a force of nature. He's not, he's not a character with any kind of vendetta against you at that point. He has no materials with which to manufacture a grudge. He's just a jerk who happens. And that splits all your characters up into three separate parties. And that's wonderful. And we're given all this opportunity for catharsis nurturing in these characters. Edgar and uh, Locke and Tara. Then the one character who has no skin in the game. No skin in the game. No shells on the table. No horse in the race. And this, his favorite tea. Oh, that tonic is also a to, oh no, I stepped into the bed and I fell asleep. That ever happened to you? That ever happened? So yeah, you get this guy, Mash Sabin, and he doesn't have any skin in the game. He doesn't hate the Empire for any particular reason other than that they look slash act like narcs, I guess. He's up in the mountain, he's got to fight a guy, whatever. Hey, what's up in this? His favorite old man. Master Duncan. Yeah, so Mash is one of the three characters who is makes up one of the parties. He's a one-man party. And when that party split happens, it's almost as though the game is tempting you to play the other two scenarios first, Locke's scenario and then Edgar Terra and uh, Bannon's scenario. There's Shadow. There he is. There he is. Shadow, the most important character in the game for an extreme number of reasons because he's the one with the mystique, the mystery, the conspiracy theory. He's the bad butt who would slit his mama's throat for a nickel. The bar is called a cafe. I love that. We weren't allowed to reference alcohol in this game. Here's Shadow's music. The best music. And he has a dog. So let's chill with the dog. <laughs> At the very least, you can give me a response. So this actually is a little, if I may be so brash and bold, it's a little bit psychopathic. At the 
very least you can give me a response. Nobody owes you god darn anything. Though in a video game we take it as second and sometimes even first nature that if I press the talk button in front of a person, I, the player, the presser of the button, am owed a response. I do not grant this world the rights of a simulacrum. I do not allow this world to have feelings. And uh, the entitlement here on Locke echoes the entitlement of most video game players, even today. He seems vaguely familiar. Wait a minute. What did Locke want to say to him? Nice dog. He owes allegiance to no one and will do anything for money. It comes and goes. Like the wind. So in the Japanese version, his name is... Kage. That's Japanese for shadow. That was a joke. What's his name in the Japanese version? Who knows off the top of their head? Who knows? What's his name? Is it shadow? Is it shadow? I'm just kidding. Okay, it's shadow. Of course it's shadow. Shadow. That's shadow. He'd slit his mama's throat for a nickel. A nickel? Is a nickel 5 GP? Are GPs just cents? Better steer clear of him, I guess. I'm going to talk to him now. Leave us. The dog eats strangers. <coughs> Clyde. Clyde is his real name, yeah. And he has a friend who, uh, tricksters in the rumors community believe is actually Kefka. Kefka gets... There's a, there's a whole lot going on between Shadow and Kefka. Oh, this guy's just gotta... Look at that. I love when, when the NPCs start walking and then you can follow them sort of a little bit. Really feels like a thing. Can I get a cider? Can I get a cider? There's just no room at the bar. What's up, eye patch man? So the whole point of this quest that we're at now is I've got to get up and over. I get up and over the mountain. We're going to go ahead and do the GP for the night. We're going to get up and over the mountain, then we're going to go find Banon, and then we are going to escape from the base, and then that's when we do the river raft ride, which has an experience loop in it, which is neat. Um, and then after that, the characters split up, and we're asked to choose which of the three stories we want to play, in which order. And I believe the game subliminally influences you to play Sabin's or Mash's last. Oh yeah, here we go. I find this... Uh, Oh, you want to come and talk to me, you little little puppy, little mogul? True knight lets you shield it. Dragoon boots, give me jump. Ah man, relics are cool. So, Final Fantasy VI has a double, sort of a double-edged system. I think it kind of has a little bit too much, uh, too much game. I think Materia is Materia is slightly more interesting, though maybe not as elegant. So what we get here is a. Uh, these re these relics will give you things. So I'm just gonna give sprint shoes to Edgar because Edgar's an idiot. He doesn't. I don't care. So he's got sprint shoes now. So now we can just run and uh, see goggles. Protects against dark. We actually have so much money. We can just buy all of these. Jewel ring protects against dark and petrify. I'm gonna buy one of those. I'm gonna buy two of those actually. Uh. That's enough. Jewel ring's good for everybody to have. Oh my god, we're so fast now. We're so fast. Okay, this is good. So it's, I believe the game is acknowledging... Uh, it, it's calling itself a failure. It's cracking an egg onto its own face when this early on they give you the option to make your character walk faster. It's like they're saying, Oh yeah, maybe it's too slow. I don't know. I, like, I feel like they should just make the character this fast. And be done with it. Don't treat it like a like like you're giving me a cookie. Right? 
this wonderful menu that just shows you if the person will get will uh, get stronger or weaker with an item. Regal Cutlass, Noise Blaster, Bio Blaster. Well, you need a Noise Blaster, and you need a Bio Blaster. You need both of those. Regal Cutlass. Uh, just go and give me two. Battle power, they call it, not attack power. It's so strange. Mithril Blade. All right. My boys are in charge. And it also added this Optimum, which... Oh, lol. Lol, I just bought him an item that the Mithril Pike that I got from Mog was, like, way stronger. And you know, you're gonna actually drive yourself into a wildness if you try to sell your items. You have just no limit. There is no god darn limit here. I bought a regal... I bought a Mithril Blade I didn't need. And I bought a... I just... I... I, I got extravagant. On accident. Extravagant on accident. I got armor now. Everybody is everybody gonna need one of these? Give me the... Just give me two of those. And, uh... Hairband? Plumed hat? Cotton robe? What kind of guy's gonna wear a cotton robe? into a fight heavy shield um I'm gonna get two for you chumps wait we own two heavy shields what oh wait are they what am I wilding out what's going on meets we're piking a buckler but the buckler's better make mine a buckler anytime friend bro hold on look how fast these menus are huh oh heavy shield kung fu suit Heavy shield. Okay. Now we go back in and take a look. It's just real high speed, you know, Las Vegas style item purchase. Cotton robe. Give me that. Pop me in. They don't let you equip it during the menu because menus are fast in this game. That's why you need the 60 FPS. Hairband. You want a hairband? Three plumed hats. We're going to get three plumed hats. Okay. And then uh, we should be loaded up. We should be golden and solid. And then we should, uh, we're gonna equip some relics. I give, I'm gonna put jewel ring in his second slot and her first slot there. They got two jewel rings. Dark and petrify protection. That's good. It's not 100%, I don't think. It's less than 100%. Most stuff in the world is less than 100% of whatever it is it's any percent of. Yeah, I bought a whole bunch of stuff that I shouldn't have bought and I just messed it up. Who cares? Thing is, money is fast, money is loose, money is hot and hard. Where, where your money really goes in this game, and I'll tell you straight up, goes into these potions, dude. Phoenix Down is really expensive. We have sleeping bags. Oh, what's this? No elixir in the clock. We need to find an elixir in the clock. Such a brisk speed I'm able to walk at. I remember seeing this little town and just thinking how novel it was that it has all these footbridges that go up above it and around it. Thinking it would be cool someday if I could find a real world place that was like this. And then it turns out this is just Tokyo. Everywhere in Tokyo there's just bridges that go up above the towns. Just walk on a bridge over a thing. Just bridges and walkways. The whole god darn city is just like a big old shopping mall. It's lovely. I need to get an elixir from the clock. Anyway, I think I have to stop playing this game because if I don't, Lord knows I'm just gonna I'm just gonna teenager out on it. I'm gonna bonk myself down. I would play this game and I would play it till I myself was just flopped into a tizzy. I would be out of control. <laughs> just walk into bed and talk politics with the person sleeping within. Oh yeah, the cafe. Wait, is that the guy who would slit his mama's throat for a nickel? We'd better steer clear of him. Dude, get out of the way. Get out. Get. Come on. Crikey. 
In Final Fantasy 4, you could push people from behind by, uh, by, like, pressing into them. Though in Final Fantasy 6, you can't, interestingly. I mean, you could push them, though it looked like it was their idea. It was fun. Ooh. Grab a barrel, get a tonic. Shout me out in the comments if you love root beer and when you first played this game, you expected there to be root beer in those barrels. We're going to go ahead and save our game. I think we've played enough. I mean, we haven't played enough. That's the thing about this game. Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy III, an essential video game. Absolutely essential video game. So wildly, impossibly essential that I would recommend it to everyone. And yeah, once you, you just gotta, it, it just, it pounds out the hits. It gets to the point where it splits up the party into three directions and you do the three scenarios and one of them is just so big. Two of the, two of the scenarios are people with, with reasons for wanting to fight the Empire and the third scenario is a guy who doesn't really have a reason, who gets a whole bucket full of reasons, they experiences horrors and atrocities firsthand, meets some ghosts, sees a whole castle full of people get poisoned to death. Mash's little quest, Sabin, if you're a if you're a if you're a Final Fantasy 3 purist. Final Fantasy 6 Mash has this big old long quest that is storied and elegant and interesting. And then you assemble all your people together, have a huge real-time strategy battle, and then you go far away to a new land and you experience the opera house scene. And the opera house scene comes and it, it, it just it just shakes up what you think about video games. When I first saw the opera house, it blew my mind. My baseball cap flew off the top of my god darn head. It flew right off the top of my head. And the opera house scene gets all the credit and it gets all the yells now, 25 years later. People just say opera house, opera house. You mentioned Final Fantasy VI. Somebody's like, oh, opera house, dude. Well, I really thought that was going to get him. People are just like, yeah, dude, Opera House, man. Yeah. And it's like, the Opera House is great. However, we often forget to lovingly critique the beautiful parade of events that leads up to the Opera House. It is so pristinely paced. Many of us would have stopped paying attention before the Opera House even shows up a dozen hours into the game if it had not been for the wonderfulness that is the game up to that point. Oh, we got a couple of Tuskers here. Should have split up that damage. See, I feel like if this combat was turn-based, it would be so much better. They just hadn't invented that timeline. It would it would go so much faster. There are so many idle moments where you're just like waiting for somebody's bar to, to charge. 108 experience points. There are so many twists and so many turns in Final Fantasy VI that blew my mind as I played the game. And then even after the Opera House, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop being wildly entertaining and innovative. And that's why it's probably the best Final Fantasy game. My favorite is Final Fantasy IV. And I think the most important is Final Fantasy VII. And I think the most interesting is Final Fantasy XII. Every one of them gets an adjective. Though this one's probably the best. Does that make sense? Maybe Final Fantasy VIII's the most interesting. Crikey. I don't know. I'm not really sure. Though I just don't see why this one's not... Not the ultimate. Because it is. And it's got everything everybody likes. Final Fantasy VII came along and... Kind of spread around its mainstream threw a whole bunch of CG at everybody and TV commercials on MTV. 
There was already true believers. And I feel like we were essential to the success of that game. Someone I, uh, someone in the chat asking, did I play six before seven? I'm 40 god darn years old, man. I played one before two. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, I played I played them all in the in the in the right order. In the release order. North American release order. I didn't play five until until I had moved to Japan and fulfilled the dream, which was to uh the dream is of course to play Final Fantasy V. That's the real dream. Mount Colts. Again, I can't stop. I just can't stop. Real simple combat. The combat kind of complexes itself up. You get the relic system, which lets you give people wider range of abilities, and you get the magicites with the espers that allow you to learn magic and skills. Kind of like training your little Pokemon, leveling it up. Also, espers infer upon the wielder a level up bonus. Like some will make you earn a higher magic stat when you level up. So you have a, a limited number of builds you can actually do, which is neat. You can't grind into oblivion. The game actually forces you to make a bunch of choices, which is neat. Ah, crike. E. I really wanted to get off that heal spell. No matter, I can do it here. Just split it up among all three of these. Oh, there's a box I missed. We can get the box later. Love that rope bridge. I just remember this screenshot in EGM, this right here, and just being like, Oh, it looks so good. My brother's like, uh, it, it just looks just like Final Fantasy 2, man. It's like, you filthy pathological liar. That's what I wanted to say to him. I can't stress this enough. This game looked incredible. In the year 1994. It looked as incredible to me, a diehard Final Fantasy 4 player as Final Fantasy VII eventually did. I'm gonna use the sleeping bag. Oh, you can use it on one person. Crikey. I guess I... Uh, let that fall out of my encyclopedia. Just tonic it up. Potion? I meant to use a tonic. Potions are more precious. Potion, high potion, as they're called. In Japanese. I was really hoping we would. Oh, Trillium, a Tusker, and a, a Serpius. You just hit me? Let's actually try Bio Blaster. Let's slip the fogs of war here. Let's go. Oh my god, that's criminal. Fools got ripped up by that Bio Blaster. They're poisoned. Doing a little less than a nickel's worth of damage every three or four minutes here. That is a pointless status ailment. Status ailments are, are pretty bone weak in uh, the, the player's experience in this game. They're not so bad in the hands of, of a skilled opponent. Though you can't really waste your opponents with status in this the way you could in Final Fantasy 7 or 8. That's a trillium. There's a couple of trilliums. You know what they say. I'm a real trillium air right now. Kill him. That's double dead. 64 experience points. Again, the level design kind of makes you feel like you're going somewhere without... It, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily feel exactly like a dungeon. It feels like a place. And they kind of did that with a more... more of a keenness toward naturalism in this game than they might have displayed in the earlier ones. And you can see how this got out of hand into the... strangely 
innavigable postcard collection of Final Fantasy VII. For the moment, it did not fail to strike any player with quaintness. The environmental design in this game, priceless, pristine. There's actually not that many natural feeling spaces. I feel like they front load this game with uh, conceptual things. Shigeru Miyamoto always says the first level of your game should be the part you make last. There's, there he is, there he is. That's our bad boy. So the first level of the game, if that's the part you make last, that first time user experience, you polish it up, you know that the game that the player's gonna get into is good. So you wanna make sure that they have a good time getting into it and you wanna make sure you build the on-ramp of the game with an eye toward what the actual experience of it is. And that's why Final Fantasy games always start with that boss where you have to not attack them during a specific phase. That's why they give us a more naturalistic looking level here at the beginning. There's a lot of geometricality later. I don't think we are prepped for this. I think we're gonna get our tiger bones broken. Did I get in fight in front of Punk? I said I was gonna end this and then I can't because you can't stop this. Everybody wants to see MASH, right? Once we see MASH, right? What you want? MASH sent you, right? Hey, what's up, Vargas? Lieutenant Vargas? Who are you? MASH? Is he here? Huh? You were shadowing us earlier, right? Brilliant. Really kind of want to play this in Japanese and kind of experience it. I want, I want to know. I feel like I know what this dialogue is all about. Oh, he's got bears, man. He's got just big, loud, crikey bears. Yelling like monsters. Screaming like freaks. Hairy and fuzzy grizzly for weeks. Stupid bears loudly scraping with claws. Freakish monster, breaking all laws. Oh wow, that's death and a half. I'm gonna give you a treat in three quarters. And you are not gonna like it. Shout me out in the comments if you uh, are getting any of this, if you're hearing any of what I'm saying. Yeah, this is a, a Final Fantasy staple. This is just a human character who is uh, just much bigger. This is like my high school experience. Like the guys on the right, that's me in high school. The guy on the left, that's uh, it's everybody else in high school. You know what I mean? Did, you, did anybody else get that? Everyone loves sashes in this game. We got Dragonista Santa, yeah. Yoshika Amano loves drawing a... Man loves a scarf. If he had his way, it'd be the law to wear a scarf. Enough! Off with ya now. Ya? Yeah? Give it up, Vargas! Oh my god, Sabin, aka Mash. Shout me out in the comments. If you love the films of Robert Altman. How could you do your own father in? I love the phrase, doing something in. He snubbed me, his only son. So he's like, ironically, Mash has stepped himself into a uh, another succession story. He left a king and a brother and a throne idea to become a mortal attack blizzard fist. Love that word combo to become the, uh, the protege of a martial arts master and incur the wrath of said martial arts master's uh, son. Biggest pupil. Tallest pupil, certainly. Somebody check the wiki. How tall is uh, MASH supposed to be? About six feet. Vargas is, what, about 18, 19 feet tall? You gotta admit, that's a big man. Fate will send you to your doom. Wait, MASH. Oh, Doomfist. 
Whew, I tire of this. Horrible. I did it. I killed you. Come on, mash. I want to suplex this moran. Incorrect blitz input, everybody. Don't hit me. I'm just a man waiting for a tutorial. You want to talk about putting an end to this? Must use a blitz technique. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Left, right, left, eh? Uh huh. Just a man with his time, his life limited. Mash talking to me. 47. There was the number 47. I really wish it would have paused. 108. Ah, uh, you're dead. He's gonna get pummeled. I actually like this blitz. You are already dead, punk. What the? He taught you how to punch fast? If only you hadn't been in such a rush for power, you would have been in a rush for punching like me. Well, you gotta punch a guy a lot in a hurry. You gotta go straight to Vargas's dad, Master Duncan. Interestingly, the Taekwondo teacher that I had at age uh, 12 on Fort Meade, Maryland, his name was Duncan Williams. And then the martial arts, uh, the, the Taekwondo teacher that I had at the YMCA on the north side of Indianapolis, Indiana in 1993 was also named Duncan Williams. Different guy. They were both Taekwondo black belts. She gets called a bodybuilder. Or he gets, he, she calls him a bodybuilder. To the returner hideout, no doubt. It's Friday afternoon, everybody. Did you notice that? It's Friday afternoon. Finger will be reduced to a puppet and say, No, no, you're the puppet. S the brother. Is there a puppet master character? Gogo's sort of a puppet master. I think a bear like me could help you in a fight. See, he's just, he, he tags along because he wants to fight. That's all. He just has big old puffed up arms. Big puffy buddy. Big old marshmallow man. Big Bibendum. Big Bibby Mimbus Bumba Dumby Bum Bibendum. Oh, help me. There's something wrong with my brain. I'm spilling my word salad. You know what? I don't care who you are or where you're from. You're gonna get shot with my crossbow in the chest. Do it. Who in the chat has seen the film Jack Reacher? Was that a Michelin Man reference? You're asking a guy wearing a god darn William Gibson jacket if it was a Michelin Man reference? Come on, of course. Yeah, Jack Reacher the movie. There's a part in Jack Reacher where just somebody please, somebody please, you must shout me out for this. There's a character played by Jai Courtney who says he has a line that's just he says to somebody, do it here. And uh, me and my buddy Michael Kerwin, uh, who could be shouting me out about this, however, he's not going to shout me out about this because I'm asking someone else and we need a new friend to shout us out about this. Who loves that line? Do it here. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's really good. Yeah, so we got a guy saying, uh, what do you got? Werner Herzog's in it. There's a part where Werner Herzog says, did I have a knife in Siberia? Which is a pretty good line. He asks a guy, did I have a knife in Siberia? Very good line. And then there is there is the line about, I'm going to kill you and drink your blood from a boot. You're going to die screaming, and then I will drink your blood from a boot. Phenomenally well-written film. 
At least if you, uh... At least if you were born with weird tastes. Some sort of, uh, an eclectic shock going on. And you know what? We're now reaching the Returner's hideout. If I hadn't... indulged myself with such preamble, I think we could perhaps have reached the story split point. Though we had a little bit of a ramble, and you know what? That's actually good. It's actually good. We're gonna go ahead and call it that. Someone complimented my Werner Herzog voice. Thanks. I, uh... I imitate him a lot, like in the shower or whatever. I talk about my shampoo and whatever, and I like to just think of Werner Herzog. Werner Herzog eats his shoe. You know what I want to see? I want to get on TV, and I want to eat a football. You know? I don't. Okay, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I think it's time to go. I'm sorry that I'm now I'm now obsessed with thinking about eating a goddamn football. Get Impossible Foods on the horn. Have them design the new official NFL game day balls. Thank you for watching the stream, everyone. Perhaps you'll be seeing an article by me about this game somewhat soon. Or maybe you won't. Because maybe I'll be too scared to let you read it because it's dark. As dark as some of the events of this game, in fact. Anyway, thanks for watching. And, uh, Tune in next time, and if you want me to play more of this game, just yell at me on Twitter or in the YouTube comments. I was born stupid, however, I will not die hungry. Video games forever. Kotaku.com.